we have a great panel, so I'm going to bring them out. Uh, editor Peter Siveris. Cinematographer Ari Wagner. Actor Cody Smith McPhee. Actor Jesse Plemons. Actor Kirsten Dunst. Actor Benedict Cumberbatch. Writer, director, producer, Jane Campion. I'm going to start by mentioning someone, someone who isn't here. Um, like everyone else up here, a great storyteller, incredibly talented, yet very few people have probably ever heard of him, and that's Thomas Savage. Uh, he wrote the novel Power of the Dog in 1967. It reportedly, it reportedly sold fewer than 1,000 copies in hardback. And at the time, according to some research, only one reviewer mentioned the word homosexual in the review. It was just avoided in all other reviews. Um, and then 20 years ago, a paperback version came out with a beautiful afterword by Annie Proulx, who wrote The Shipping News. Um, so if you want to go back and read the book and read uh, Annie's afterword, I highly recommend it. Um, and Jane, I understand you had some conversations with Annie about this book yourself. Uh, I did. And um, Tanya Sketchin was there with me too, and another of the producers. But coming from New Zealand and um, falling in love with his work, I still felt like um, I had a lot of research to do to earn my place um, as the right writer-director for this project. So we made it our business to go and spend time in Beaverhead, Montana, thinking about shooting there at the time, um, and also seeing where Thomas Savage actually grew up and lived, and the actual ranch that he really, mm. he, he, he himself lived on, and the house that had been removed from that ranch and put somewhere else. We also saw that house, which actually was just a kit house that was sort of quadrupled in size. And um, then, you know, as a as something that we just uh, really wanted to do, Tanya and I, because we, we really love Annie Prue. As we said, oh, we absolutely have to talk to her. <laughs> so we went to Port Townsend and, and had crab claws with mm. Annie Prue, and we had this amazing kind of, like, nerd out, like, amazing, I don't know, book club, just the <laughs> three of us, on Thomas, Thomas Savage's work. And she's just so savagely um, intellectual, but also... You know, despite all her strength, she's so tender, mm -hmm. so tender. And, you know, she always called Phil that savage bitch, you know. <laughs> and, um, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I, I think she had the soft spot for Phil that I have, that the fact that he's this, um, you know, lover. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, you know, you have an access to him and that... Um, He's in love, you know, he's, he's in love with the ghost of uh, Bronco Henry. Yeah. So I think, it's, I think it's worth yeah. arguing that Bronco Henry is maybe one of the most important characters in the story, and we don't see him. <laughs> um, so when you're thinking about how to visualize, how to render him visible yeah. and outward cinematically when he is not visible in the story or in the film, how do you go about solving that problem? I mean, do you even think about a flashback or... Is that how we have the scarf scene? What was your solution to that problem about this character who isn't there? In the book, there is a lot more backstory, but um, a backstory that I think has a very curious interest. However, I don't, I don't really like um, backstory. I feel like there's this expectation that um, backstory explains somebody now. And um, I think the whole mystery of personality is so much more complicated than that, that, you know no, this incident happened, therefore they're like this, really works for me. I'm, I'm in love with the mystery of mm -hmm. what a human is and how they are. Um, so one decision we made was like, let's, have, let's not have a you know, Bronco Henry moment where he appears. Um, let's, uh, let, let, let's struggle with this thing. Let's see if we can create him in the consciousness or in the presence of the story somehow or other. And then the, then the idea was just like you said, to try and come up with um, 
ways that he can manifest, like with the scarf with the BH on it. And um, I remember introducing the scarf to you, Ben. At, sorry, <laughs> Ben. And I gave him the scarf and he put it on and he went like, this feels horrible. <laughs> And I went, oh, got a new scarf. It's silk, it's silk. And he went, no, it's prickly, it's horrible. I went, oh, please, can you love it? <laughs> Did you recast the scarf? No. No? No. I don't remember. Do you remember it that way? No, no, no. no, no. no. I did. No. <laughs> Sorry. It's That's true. quite damning. It's I did have to wear it very close to my person, but um, <laughs> maybe I'm sensitive in that area. Um, <laughs> Benedict, I want to ask you about something that Annie Poole says about your character in the afterword. And she says this, his private obstacle became this thing that he knew about himself, something that in the cowboy world that he inhabited was terrible and unspeakably vile. And Savage says of Phil in the book, he had loathed the world, should it loathe him first. Hating on the world before it hates on you. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's it. The, 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 the sort of vulnerability that creates that horrible tension in a human which twists them into a pretzel of hate and distrust and fear and... Yeah, he's a man who's got incredible control. He is a savage bitch, but at the same time, it's driven by something um, deeply traumatized. I mean, something that's been, he's cut adrift very early in his life from the capacity to love or be loved. He's not left with much canvas in that regard. And I guess that the tragedy of what unfolds in this section of his life and the end of it is that just as he might potentially be opening up into being someone who could receive and give love again, it's he's you know he's already sown the seeds of his own demise with the treatment of the people around him and that's it's it's over but um yeah i, I think it's just a it's a very tragic story of a man who um, was incapable to fully realize his authentic self um yeah i think i think his masculinity is often talked about as being a performative i don't think it is i think that is who he is right. i think bronco was like that but he was they were both men who loved each other but um, yeah I don't think the behavioral pattern there is to disguise what's underneath he, he sees Peter's feetness as a front to his masculinity and of course it's a deeper tremor of like this person is sort of a manifestation of the thing I've tried to suppress um, not in behavior but in my actual yearning and my actual being of what I'm attracted to and want to be with and uh I think, you know, this happened when he was 19 and right. it's 20 late, you know, over 20 years later. There's a lot of it that's unresolved. He, he connects with it in a very sensual and real way with the uncomfortable scarf uh, previously mentioned. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, um, I think it's a profound investigation on a sensual level. I don't think he fully understands it even. And like, it's, it's something he wants to keep hidden. It's something that... So when he's prying... It's, it's dirty to him in a way. Right. Um, and maybe less so in Jane's, realize, our realization of him. Maybe there's more of an explicit exploration of that. But. So when he's trying to pry Peter away from Rose, it is half scheme and half affection? I think he sees the strength of someone who's not ashamed to be the true right. to themselves. And I think that really surprises him in that mm -hmm. catcalling and, and whistling in the haymaking scene. And he sees a strength and a purpose in Peter that he hadn't read before. And he's like, oh, there's something to this guy. But at the same time, he's still literally in a, with a rope in his hand trying to rip the umbilical cord away from the mother he's trying to destroy. Right. I mean, it's very, it's very savage, that moment of recruiting in the island, going over to Rose so that she's witnessing this and being pained by it. But um, it, And then within that gameplay, the shifts of power and the shifts of the dynamic and feeling are, are, are very subtle and, and, and I think powerfully, unexpectedly powerful for him, you know. And obviously Phil does some things that are cruel, but he is also complicated. I mean, he's an artist. He reads books, he can whittle, he can braid, um, he's musical. So how did you find a path into understanding what you could latch onto him as a person that made him maybe not likable, but understandable? Because I think the, the challenge of this part is to make Phil's inner life understandable and relatable, even if he behaves badly. Uh, the answer is kind of in the question. I mean, I think the gift of this role is, uh, you know, well, the, the m multiple gifts, but not least that it's being realized by a master in the form of Jane Campion. I mean, the way she levels the story and structures it so that you are 
your witness to this abhorrent behavior and then allowed into an understanding of what makes him tick, looking under the hood of that toxic masculinity and going, oh, okay, there's this deep pain is, uh, is, is brilliantly realized in her script and direction and, and Pete's editing and Larry's camera work and, and everything that goes on around that with the music as well. But I think what I, the clue into him that I, ha I mean, I went on the journey the audience does, hopefully, um, when I first read the book and the script and, I, I, you know, I was sort of terrified of him, in awe of him. I, I didn't, you know, I, I thought somebody incredibly dangerous who you wouldn't necessarily want to get close to. And then seeing this vulnerability, seeing this pain made it very, very human. We all have it, you know, we all have it. Even this great filmmaker has it, which emboldens you to then feel vulnerable and take risks and be bold because she's doing it all the time, despite how brilliant she is. And so... It, it's, 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 a, it's a human condition. It's a human condition, and it's part of the human condition, I should say. And to be able to hold a secret as an actor on screen is obviously a real gift, but also to be able to explore that secret, that's a, that's a double joy. Mm -hmm. um, and I did through, like you say, this, these hands that can kill uh, and maim or, or, or castrate can also whittle a fine, you know, work on a miniature table or chair <laughs> and play the banjo with, you know, expert dexterity. And this mind that's cruel and speaks like folk and acts like folk and is very direct can also quote Cicero and, and anything else you like and play chess, etc. To, to hold those polarities is, is a really rich experience for an actor. There's so much to play with. You know? I can imagine. Kirsten Thomas Savage writes of your character, she felt suffocated in the void between her intention and her ability and shattered by loneliness. It's beautiful language. Um, and that feels specific to Rose and also probably specific to the era, that this is a woman who is successful. She's a single parent. She's a widow. She has her own business. And yet there are things that she can and cannot do, that she is trapped in her own body and in her own house. How did you come to understand like her capabilities and how the, the era basically locked her into a life that she couldn't leave? You know, I think they get together because they kind of recognize a loneliness within each other. And... and I don't know. In order to play Rose, I just had to kind of get into and find this own my own headspace of this this insecurity and this way in which you allow yourself to be a vulnerable enough to let the smallest thing kind of infiltrate your brain in a way that can really destroy that you can destroy yourself with the with the smallest thing and let that insecurity just grow. So for me, the house and and being on that ranch, yeah, me as Kirsten, I, I would be like, listen, your brother's driving me nuts. <laughs> but as a Rose, she's very polite and well-mannered and a people pleaser and all the things that grounded her as this, you know, widow and running this inn, you know, the simplest thing like cooking and cleaning, the things that give her a purpose, everything's stripped. And then she's kind of in her own house of horrors there in that home, in that ranch. So it was a lot of like making my own, making myself feel terrible <laughs> because we don't really have any scenes together. So I kind of just had to create my own monsters within myself to, to work with. I want to ask you about something that happened in post. Robert McKenzie added this beautiful sound design around your character. And that's basically that Phil can silence the world. He can hear a creak in a floorboard. He can hear a nor uh, doorknob turn. He can hear a bottle open. He can hear the faintest sound. But your world is overwhelmed by nature, that you're never silent, that you are surrounded by the outside world and can't silence yourself inside it. Is that something you talked about while you're filming or did you not come to realize it till after the film was put together? Did you talk with Jane about it? Um, not about specifically like the sounds of the name. I mean, I created, created my own. I actually listened to a lot of Johnny Greenwood. I listened to the soundtrack of There Will Be Blood a lot because I figured because he's going into the soundtrack, I was like, if I live within this world already, then maybe it'll be easier for him to score my scenes, maybe, you know? So I did use that soundtrack, especially with the Native Americans towards the end. Like, it was my emotional base for that scene was score from that film. So I, but I didn't know so much about what you're talking about. I wasn't kind of informed about, maybe that was something that was found later, I'm not sure. In terms of like the nature and the sound mm -hmm. effects. Um, is that from the book? <laughs> no, yeah, it it's not from the book. It's, it's from the sound designer, right? It's from right? the movie. It's yeah, not from like... the book. 
<laughs> Sounds really good. I mean, yeah, I was like, no. cool. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember that. You should go back yeah, and listen to it. No, we, um, <laughs> we, Robert McKenzie is super smart and was our mixer and sound designer. And we talked about, like, what we were going to emphasize. And some of the things were, like, uh, Phil's boots and his um, spurs. Mm -hmm. So you could always hear that little clink or... And also how quiet he could move at times. Right. Um, but these things wouldn't, like, this isn't what's going to scare me as an actress, you know what I mean? Like, somebody whistling isn't going to scare me. You know what I mean? Like, I had to create my own <laughs> fear other than... Scared us. Whistle or a banjo. <laughs> I know, I, I, I made you feel scared. <laughs> <laughs> no, we know you don't scare easy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't worried. Uh, um, Jesse Jane talked about how she doesn't like a lot of backstory or exposition, but given George's history with Phil, we don't really know a lot about what has kept them together and how George has managed that relationship but you, as an actor, probably have to think of what that bond is, how you have managed as a, as a character to work with your brother. What were the answers that you came up with about what has kept them together and how you have managed to survive his wrath? That, that was kind of the overriding, um, uh, I, I guess, exploration, especially early on, was trying to trying to figure out a way to convey all of this history with very little dialogue where like immediately you know you don't you don't need to be told anything to know the dynamic between these two brothers um and i was i i think initially i i sort of in in you know reading the book reading the script I think I was sort of influenced by Phil's opinion of, of George. And you, you start to realize that a lot of what you're hearing about his character, who he is, it's all through the lens of Phil, you know. And then in talking with Jane and, and, and doing, um, you know, and these rehearsals and improvisations, I, th I think it was something that Jane said, well, you know, George really does what he wants. <laughs> you know, he... he and he could he could very well leave. He could have a fine, comfortable life somewhere else, but he chooses not to. And so it was like it became more about thinking about why why he does what he does and and how how he how he manages to deal with his brother. And I think I I think he you know is is privy to a side of Phil that 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 most people are, are are not welcomed into and and I think at the same time which Benedict talked about earlier either in this or one of the other ones um, <laughs> <laughs> um let's say it was this one <laughs> this one um that th that the the more you think about the information that that you read in the book there 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 had to have been a, a sort of a, a sense that that our parents this was kind of a lark right. you know coming coming to buy this this ranch it was like something that that you do out of uh, just on a whim and we really took to the way of life and I think there was a real love there and and there, there was also you know they were incredibly codependent and um, it's it's very complicated, and I could just ramble on for no, another hour no, if you'd like. But no, I'm stop. Yeah, 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 one of the things I really loved when I read the book was that they shared a bedroom. Right. Yeah. Like their childhood bedroom, right. their two little beds together, and their adult man, you know, and they had a I don't know, fourteen yep. roomed house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I. So like this is so awesomely strange and peculiar, and you know. What a magnificent separation that's going to be when that falls apart. Right. You know? yeah. But there's no, a bond. Accurate. Yeah. I mean, accurate in terms of like when, when I mean, that, that isolation out there, right. you know, and then family dynamics too. It's like you can be, you, you, you can be f fully just screaming at the top of your lungs at a person and 
unable to escape them at the same time, you know, totally dependent on on them at the same time. So that was interesting. You're talking about a lot of marriages. Um, I hope not yours. Um, Cody, I want to ask... <laughs> Uh, it's been a long day. I want to ask you about a particular scene, Cody, and that's when Peter walks in his crunchy jeans um, and his white, I don't know if we can call them trainers, tennis shoes, uh, past a gauntlet of men who insult him, and he does something remarkable. He doesn't take the back way. He walks back in front of them, and it's when Phil starts to notice that this kid is not is more than he appears. But I'm curious in your character's mind, or is this... Is he playing chess already? And is he already two moves ahead of Phil? Does he realize that he holds a power over Phil that Phil maybe doesn't realize that Peter has at this point? Um, I guess obviously the beauty of that is that so much of his internalized um, mission, I guess, is left up for interpretation. But um, asking me and I guess my personal approach, yes, uh, I think he started that mission very early on. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's it's all in the courage and the pride that he has in himself and an unwavering um, uh, essence that, that no matter how much he's combated, he's not going to change for anyone. Um, but, yeah, definitely, I mean, we put a lot of thought behind that scene and uh, Jane had very specific point of view on that and something that she wanted to convey uh, beyond words and so yeah I think it's I think it's quite intentional yeah and do you think there's a special affinity with Phil because of a shared secret of of a common link that maybe you're both unwilling to express um Possibly Phil. I mean, I can only speak on behalf of your portrayal of the character. But, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously Phil has a lot of things in terms of his authenticity that he's he's repressing. Um, but with Peter, I don't think it's a matter of that. I think um, he's more possibly exploring mm -hmm. his sexuality at that point. Um, I'm sure there's a point in, your life, in his life where he would have solidified it and he would have been completely equally confident in expressing it. Um, it's just that he's been so isolated up to this point and he's had the responsibility of uh, looking after his mother um, that he hasn't really thought about the endeavor of love or intimacy until, you know, we peel back the layers and, and they, they both become slightly vulnerable in uh, butting heads but also creating some form of sensuality there or, or um, a spark of, of romance, romance, I guess. But no, I don't think Peter is necessarily one to repress or hide that. I think he's completely solidified in who he, who he is. No, he's probably the most emotionally intelligent character in the entire story. Ari, uh, cinematographers often start working with directors a month or two before principal photography. You expanded that out a little bit by, what, 10 months? Just a little, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you spent how much time working together before principal photography, and what were the conversations in that long prep time? Yeah, in general, you know, if you're lucky, you might get eight weeks. It's like good deal, <laughs> good, good, good amount of time. And um, but for this one, one of the caveats Jane had when we when we very first spoke is that she wanted a, a DP who would start pretty much straight away. Like, let's go. And um, to be honest, that was uh, that was a dream for me, really. Um, not just obviously to uh, work with Jane, but but to do it properly, you know, the way you've always wanted to do it and be able to really just have your ideas get past the first draft, you know? Like, writing a script takes can take years or a long time because there's things that need to be thought about and thought about deeply, but if you've only got eight weeks or six weeks or four weeks and there's not time to get beyond the first draft of ideas, you've got to shoot day one's coming next week, let's do it, but if you have a year then um, you can actually think about it and as soon as I read the script I knew this is this is a, this is a film that needs planning because I want to do it right and I mean um, we, we I guess we we had many many sessions and trips down to scouting and, and conversations but um, and I could have gone and done other things probably but to be honest my mind was uh, I was in the bubble. I was under the spell of Montana in the 20s and to 
even try and do something else was a, a futile <laughs> thing. Yeah, conversations about ev everything you just saw from storytelling, architecture to um, color palette, character intention, um, and then just also really getting to know each other because shooting a film is quite a it's a, an experience, <laughs> and you need a ally. You need you know we're all kind of here together. Maybe you feel the energy of this kind of getting the band back together and it really is that it's very like uh, bonding formation and um, especially for a director and DP uh, it's not not every day is, is a real pleasure as much as we're kind of <laughs> high on the um, the vibe but you need someone to be your um, ally and that also takes time so the year was a lot of script work as well <laughs> to make all those decisions but then just being in the same place in the same mind in the same place and what were your rules about handheld photography and about where it would be used and with which characters yeah i'm really glad you asked that it's kind of a um that was a big big one for us and actually it morphed along the way which is again testament to jane to say we have all these well-laid plans but then you also have to respond in the moment to what works and what doesn't um we had initially only planned to do the handheld in the what we'd called the sacred place in that um willowy kind of glade where we we're alone with phil and phil's completely unguarded um or or his exhale of here we are and we get to learn something new about him um but after we shot them it came apparent to us that there was some kind of alchemy going on between the camera Benedict, me, Jane, and what could, uh, what it opened up to have the camera be responsive in an unplanned way, but to respond a lot more organically. So we did, um, after that, make the decision to bring that handheld camera inside and use it whenever, I guess it felt right, but what it kind of ended up being is Phil unguarded, or Phil with his guard down a bit, whether he's alone or, or super angry or Phil that's lost, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. You, I mean, we also did, or you did some beautiful handheld stuff, I think, with uh, Phil when he lost his temper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, and um, when Peter comes in and talks to him and says he's got some rawhide strips. Yeah, that's a, I love that scene. And I, that, that's um, sick. That's so yeah. <laughs> and that shot of the rawhide from below, too. It's yeah. It's a beautiful shot. Yeah, I, um, there's something that happens. I don't know if it's for every person that operates a camera or just me, but when the when you're handheld and the camera's rolling and the action's happening in front of you and you're so connected, it's like a kind of present meditation and um, that's even a joy in itself. But I think, um, yeah, something very alchemy kind of thing that happens. Peter, so much of a movie can be discovered or rediscovered through editorial that the filmmaker may go into editing thinking there's one kind of movie that's going to come out and another movie comes out. Would you say that that happened on this film and what? how would you chart the course of how the movie changed through editorial? Uh, that's a good question too. Um, I mean, things always evolve and change. I, I don't think it's different, but there are a lot of discoveries, a lot of... Um, a lot of restructuring, just moving things, pairing things, strengthening um, moments. Like, uh, I guess a good example of that's Phil swimming naked and pairing that with the sal saddle that used to come far earlier in mm -hmm. the story. And just just building up those moments and uh, emotions and depth to character. So, yeah, I don't think it necessarily changes but you know there were a lot of changes made to get to to the point we got to what was the hardest scene to crack uh there there are quite a few <laughs> I, I i think uh um, would you and jane agree on on which ones they were uh, i was gonna say haymaking jane what do you think well, tell, tell us about that <laughs> what was the challenge in that scene there's just so many points of view yeah right? and it's uh, you know i think it's an extremely ambiguous scene uh, and I, I wanted to keep that ambiguity, but also like make sure we hit some points hard, like that Rose was noticing what was happening, that Phil was noticing Rose noticing, <laughs> um, that that he was uh, kind of seduce or bringing his her son close, which who really was her you know the last resort of support, 
Um, so, and, and then just the not really knowing was what was Phil up to. Right. Um, I wanted it not to know exactly what it was because we shouldn't know. And even maybe, maybe Phil didn't know. Um, well, here's my last question. It's about the title of the book and the film. Um, Power of the Dog is in Exodus. This verse, and ye shall be holy men unto me, neither shall ye eat any flesh that is torn of beasts in the field. Ye shall cast it to the dogs. There's the dog in the mountains that only Phil, Bronco, Henry, and Peter can discern. Um, and then there's the biblical reference to where in ancient times dogs were seen as a lowly pack of scavengers who attacked the vulnerable. So did you have an interpretation of what the power of the dog meant in this story? Um, well, I was using the Psalm um, 2022, 20, where, um, which I think is where his quote came from, the power of the dog. Um, and it's a very visceral, extremely extraordinary psalm, which has Jesus on the cross dying and um, the sense of his insides melting together and um, just an incredible agony. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about what the psalm actually means and there's not a sort of one-to-one -one meaning of it. But I think uh, there's, a, you know, what I think we're talking about is a sort of bestial, savage, like um, the most sort of essential agony, etc. But where I think... You know, you're asking me what I think the power of the dog means in terms of the title of both the book and the film. I, I think it's a warning. I think it's a warning and um, kind of beautifully unknown, ambiguous, but really saying um, the dog is that um, beast that when it, you know, it gets to show its power, um, you better be careful because it's going to be out of control. What a perfect convocation for a cocktail party, um, which we're going to have. Peter, Ari, Cody, Jesse, Kirsten, Benedict, Jane, thank you all for coming and thank for sharing you your film with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.